Testing one, two. For those of you um, that are on social media, you can share our Facebook post because it's also promoting the uh, live stream of the event. So feel free to go onto the face Facebook page and click share. Um, uh, Alessio, just I presume people will find out the language channels, but is it number one is French? No, number one is Spanish. Number one is Spanish. Number two is English. Number three is French. Oh, sorry, other way around. One Spanish, two English. Uh, two French, three English. One Spanish, two French, three English for the interpretation. Perfect. And I'm assuming we start in one minute. You said it in English. Maybe you can say it in French. Spanish. <laughs> So we just need a couple of minutes to get the live stream aligned.
So welcome to this uh, press conference uh, about FACE uh, European Hunters campaign. We are 45 years in Brussels and we took the decision to launch this campaign because we have never seen as many problems affecting hunting and conservation in Europe. We are partners for conservation. We are the solution to many of the challenges we face. Three quarter of Europe's land is under hunting management. We are essential for wildlife conservation and management. We have the evidence also to show this. The campaign is calling on Brussels to work with us and to see us as genuine, genuine partners. Already we have almost 200,000 signatures, including the physical one. <clears throat> and I want to welcome our speakers and press joining us as well as FACE members and others. This press conference is being live streamed so we will have a big audience watching online and i look forward to your continued support and now i'm going to pass over to david skellen our secretary general to give an opening presentation and to moderate the event so welcome everyone Good morning, guests, face members, um, colleagues, and a very good morning to those that are also joining online because we have this live streamed. So I will give a short presentation about um, the rationale behind this campaign that we are running in conjunction with our members. As the face president, Torbjörn Larsson said, we are 45 years in Brussels and for most of that, we have worked very constructively with uh, EU policy and decision makers. And our main message is that we are partners in terms of solving the big issues that we need to solve in Europe today. Big issues around biodiversity and big issues around climate. However, as the president said, in recent years, we've seen a number of um, problems where we believe these could have been avoided in particular, if there was a perspective um, that was really strongly seen us as being partners and part of the solution. The campaign website is well known, but for those of you joining online or that don't have information about the campaign, it is on signforhunting.com, translated into the European languages. Uh, and you can see there is a mechanism to sign. We have 150,000 plus that have signed thus far. But this figure is almost 200,000 when you capture the uh, physical signatures. And we may have a discussion on that because we don't have a strong culture of campaigning as European hunters. Whereas in recent years, there is an increased focus on the use of campaigns uh, by many interest groups, in particular by environmental interest groups. So the initiative for this campaign has been one that has been seen to be rather experimental in a way. And the reason why it's important to mention our paper-based signatures is because in many parts of Europe, um, there just isn't that connectivity to smartphones and laptops. And some of our members have been active in getting to Europe's hunters. Our campaign website has all of the information about the campaign, uh, including a section on frequently asked questions, which describes in more detail what we're asking for. Importantly, there is a nine point petition uh, that is setting out the core uh, asks of FACE. Uh, and you can see these on the website. One important point about this campaign, we as the president said, have been and are playing a major role when it comes to the conservation of uh, habitats and species in Europe. We know this via our biodiversity manifesto. We have been mapping the conservation efforts of hunters around Europe, and we're making an important contribution to um, farmland habitat restoration, uh, to species recovery, uh, to the creation and management of wetlands, to managing woodlands, etc. Um, and I would add that we also play an important role in Europe's protected areas. 
many of our projects in our biodiversity manifesto are um, showing that hunters are a good force in Europe's protected areas. So that is uh, important. Why is Brussels important when it comes to hunting and conservation in Europe? At the moment, we estimate that about 80% of the rules affecting hunting and conservation at the national level are coming from Brussels. For those of you online, you cannot see this, but for those of you in the room, this image depicts this quite well. Everything from the regulation that surrounds your hunting dog to the types of firearms you can use, uh, how you can uh, store them, possess them, what you can put into your firearm in terms of the reach regulation on lead and ammunition, the birds you can hunt, when you can hunt them, also in the future, probably where you can hunt them. And there's a whole raft of uh, EU and international policy on the uh, conservation of habitats via the Habitats Directive, the Birds Directive, um, Water Framework Directive. Um, also, underlying these, we have important international agreements like the Bern Convention. Uh, the whole network of protected areas in Europe is uh, based on EU policy. Um, we have new initiatives coming that we welcome, for example, the Restoration Law, um, and we have uh, much more of a reach from the from Brussels to um, land use policy at national level, I think more so than people previously thought of. So this is important to show you the amount of uh, rules and regulations coming from Brussels at the national level. In some cases, there is good flexibility uh, in the context of directives, and in some cases, that flexibility is um, disappearing. And in some cases, you need to directly apply regulations. The campaign highlights the problem. And to put this very simply, our main message is work with us. We are part of the solution. And that is in the context of the big um, push towards delivering for conservation and biodiversity and for climate. And you may ask, what types of problems uh, are you referring to? And this goes into the heart of why we initiated this campaign. And I mentioned that we have an increasing number of problems affecting hunting and conservation. Um, and for our, um, uh, our, our membership in, in particular, sometimes it's difficult to understand when you have a very successful wildlife conservation model, like the uh, conservation and management of the lynx in Latvia, uh, why this was once deemed to be best practice in a commission guidance document. And now, why is this now uh, part of an infringement procedure? So there are bigger challenges to face than a successful model where the lynx is doing well, where hunters are core in terms of uh, monitoring and management. And this is an example, but it's highlighting some of the challenges we face when it comes to large carnivores. We're supportive, of course, of the conservation of large carnivores, but the flexibility is really disappearing. And there's increasing initiatives to call for a procedure to amend the annexes of the Habitats Directive, but we feel the Commission isn't acting on that accordingly. Unfortunately, we've had to use um, the European Ombudsman uh, on some occasions to really ensure fair play. Um, as you know, the EU is restricting lead in ammunition for all hunting and sport shooting under the REACH regulation. And there should have been no need for face to have such challenges in accessing data from the European Food Safety Agency when we spotted some issues when we received this data and then we were asking the European Chemicals Agency, you need to solve this problem. Um, we have some solutions in the context of a new consultation opened that we engaged in. We had similar problems with the restriction on lead shot over wetlands in principle this should have been a very easy regulation to get over the line. It wasn't easy because it wasn't workable. We believed it wasn't fair. And that's why only 52% of the European Parliament supported it. This is why it's so important to have rules and regulations that are understandable and workable for Europe's hunters. You'll know there was um, a large discussion around the new approach globally to protect 30% of the planet, land and sea. Um, the EU is taking this approach, as will in general European policy. Um, 
we have a good network of protected areas in Europe, probably with other protected area systems covering almost 25%. There, was, there is a new uh, um, mechanism for strictly protected areas in Europe. Normally, there should be no issue for the hunting community because we are partners when it comes to implementing the protected area network. However, there was a sentence included by the commission to ban <coughs> hunting, fishing, and forestry, and mining. It was bizarre we were in the same category as mining. Um, we were unhappy. Member states were unhappy. But it's a primary example of an approach that we felt wasn't based on evidence, and it wasn't fair to try to keep Europe's hunting community out of this important approach for protected area management. There is an increasing number of uh, infringements against member states. Our members are well aware of this. And I would just say briefly, for some of these, we would argue, or we would feel within our membership that there could be um, uh, a greater look at where conservation problems really are. Uh, the example of the turtle dove, if you really wanted to approach a member state for the conservation of turtle dove, it should probably be Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, uh, and not France and Spain, where they have good work in place and good work by Europe's hunters. So this is in the context of how we feel that there could even be more objectivity in the approach to uh, infringements and the conservation of birds. I know the discussion will appear on uh, traditional hunting practices. Uh, these are small scale, culturally important, um, regulated under the birds directive. They need to be strictly controlled. Uh, they need to be having a negligible impact at any uh, uh, population level on birds. Um, but there is an increasing approach to what we feel end uh, regional hunting practices in Europe. And this is a real challenge to a Europe that we feel should be more culturally diverse. Some other issues we faced has been around categorizing hunting as a, a pressure and a threat. We're active in this debate um, uh, it, at the EU level, um, but we have had examples where hunting has been categorized, we felt at the time, very incorrectly, <coughs> almost to give um, the viewer uh, an indication that we were part of the high-level pressures on biodiversity in Europe. But in fact, when we went in and looked at this data, it wasn't the case. And we looked, we are only... 0.6 something percent of all high-ranking pressures on nature. Um, that's a context to some of the challenges that we're facing, and that's giving rationale to why this campaign exists and why we are working with our members and Europe's 7 million hunters to uh, <coughs> express themselves to this campaign, to call for, one, see us as being partners to the challenges we face, work with us, and we want fair play because we have a lot to do in the European project towards conservation <coughs> biodiversity. So that's an introduction. Now we will move to the uh, first set of speakers. We have some uh, of our members, some of the big members in Europe, um, not to um, say anything against some of our smaller members, but in terms of reach and in terms of numbers of hunters in Europe, uh, we wanted to give the big countries some space to explain why the campaign is important and there are some specific <laughs> themes here so first i'm delighted to welcome president willy schran who is the president of the french national hunters federation to uh, give a short intervention so president schran you're you're welcome Merci. <coughs> Mesdames et messieurs les invités, mes chers collègues, mes chers amis, euh, renforcer la voie du monde rural est aujourd'hui un objectif que nous partageons bien sûr évidemment tous à la face, qui représente, je vous le rappelle, et nous l'avons déjà, 17 millions de pratiquants et combien d'en font de dizaines de millions de sympathisants. Rien qu'en France d'ailleurs, si aujourd'hui il y a environ un million de personnes qui prennent un permis de chasser, N'oublions pas qu'il y a plus de 4 millions de personnes qui en ont un dans la poche et qui en ont un dans leur cœur. Nous n'avons pas, nous chasseurs, nous le savons, le monopole de la ruralité, mais 
Nous en sommes évidemment une composante essentielle sur les territoires et dans les actions que nous menons pour le maintien et le développement de la biodiversité, mais aussi pour les équilibres de tous nos écosystèmes et ceci pour toutes les espèces, qu'elles soient chassables ou non. Nous faisons partie intégrante de cette réalité territoriale, économique et sociale qui détermine nos modes de vie et nos traditions de génération en génération. Cette ruralité tente de résister aujourd'hui au dogmatisme anti-chasse les plus durs qui soient, qui condamne nos pratiques sans savoir et préfère brandir l'interdiction de tout ou presque comme quelque chose de normal et de logique. Malheureusement, de nombreux politiques, sans courage et sans conviction, qui décident en fonction de l'opinion majoritaire, souvent d'ailleurs sur les réseaux sociaux, ce mainstream qui uniformise aujourd'hui l'Europe et nous tire chaque jour un peu plus vers le néant écologique. Sans oublier évidemment la Direction Générale de l'Environnement Européen qui théorise la nature et considère la chasse comme l'une des principales menaces pour la biodiversité malgré les preuves manifestes du contraire. Bruxelles a la main mise sur de nombreuses décisions qui impactent les pratiques de la chasse et les traditions qui y sont liées. C'est une évidence. Et ce n'est d'ailleurs pas être anti-européen que de l'affirmer. La liste des espèces chassables, comme le disait David, c'est Bruxelles. Les dates de chasse, c'est Bruxelles. Les modes de chasse, y compris celles qui font partie de notre identité culturelle et de notre patrimoine national, c'est Bruxelles. Les armes à feu et les munitions que nous pouvons utiliser, ou plutôt que nous ne pourrons bientôt plus utiliser, c'est Bruxelles. Les grands carnivores qui doivent remplacer demain les chasseurs, selon certains grands théoriciens de l'évolution, dans un monde totalement idéalisé, c'est Bruxelles. Sans oublier l'extension à outrance des zones protégées aux dépens des pratiques rurales, économiques et passionnelles, c'est-à-dire en enlevant les femmes et les hommes sur ces territoires, c'est encore et toujours Bruxelles. L'Europe n'hésite pas à jouer un jeu dangereux en sacrifiant notre avenir de ruraux et celui des 7 millions de chasseurs européens, de leurs amis et bien sûr de leurs familles. Ces décisions hors sol mettent en péril ces territoires déjà extrêmement fracturés, nos traditions, nos arts de vivre. Mes amis, face à ces vents contraires, je veux affirmer ici que nous devons résister et défendre notre identité, car la ruralité est une chance pour l'Europe et les chasseurs sûrement la meilleure possibilité des gestions des territoires qui soient. Plutôt que de nous combattre de façon idéologique, et sans aucun discernement. Nous pourrions être le meilleur atout de la politique européenne en matière de biodiversité, car nous sommes présents sur tous les territoires. Il n'y a pas un mètre carré qui ne soit aujourd'hui foulé par un chasseur à un moment dans une année. Je remercie bien sûr la face et son président, Tobian Larsson, pour cette pétition « Sign for Hunting » que nous devons tous signer pour dire à l'Europe qu'elle doit travailler avec nous et surtout plus contre nous. Je dis souvent que la ruralité n'est pas un point géographique, mais un état d'esprit. Nous avons des valeurs et des compétences à faire partager et je suis convaincu qu'elles sont résolument modernes et que sur les territoires ruraux, nous ne sommes pas un problème, mais sûrement la solution à de nombreux problèmes. Encore faut-il nous faire confiance et cesser de nous faire passer au mieux pour des idiots et souvent pour des barbares. Nous devons, nous, ruraux, être solidaires entre nous. La reconquête de la ruralité passe par l'union de tous les acteurs de la ruralité dans tous les pays. C'est peut-être ambitieux, mes amis, mais l'unité est un passage obligé pour peser dans le débat et, replacer, et renforcer notre juste place. Et si la Commission européenne devait continuer à faire la foudre sourde oreille 
bien que je sais qu'à cet instant, elle nous écoute. Il est évident que le temps de l'action en 2024 devra être pour nous une priorité pour notre survie. J'imagine, mes amis, que nous en reparlerons bientôt. Merci à la face de nous réunir aujourd'hui pour construire ensemble un avenir plus fort. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, President Schran. Uh, and just to note, we will have time for questions, answers, comments after the short interventions. Next up, I am delighted to introduce um, President Manuel Gallardo, who is president of REFEG, the Royal Spanish Hunting Federation. So uh, please welcome to the podium, Manuel. Buenos días. Eh, eh, un cordial saludo de, de, de los cazadores españoles. Eh, agradecer a FACE, eh, agradecer su trabajo y agradecer la oportunidad que nos da para, para expresarnos en este, en este encuentro. Eh, estamos aquí hoy, nosotros, estamos aquí todos, creo, eh, estamos todos aquí hoy representantes de, de la caza en Europa eh, para pedirle a las instituciones europeas que, y también a las nacionales que trabajen, que trabajen con nosotros, no que trabajen contra nosotros, que trabajen con los siete millones de cazadores y cazadoras a los que representamos y no legislen en contra de la caza y en contra del mundo rural. La actividad cinegética es una actividad fundamental, es una actividad muy importante para el desarrollo socioeconómico de nuestros pueblos y obviamente para un, un correcto desarrollo de las actividades que se desarrollan en el mundo rural y también una herramienta imprescindible para la conservación y para el mantenimiento de la biodiversidad. En España la, la caza genera 6.500 millones de euros al año, crea y mantiene 250.000 puestos de trabajo. Invertimos en conservación con el dinero de los cazadores más de 300 millones de euros y las arcas del Gobierno español en impuestos recaudan más de 700 millones de euros. Lo hemos dicho en, en muchísimas ocasiones. La, no hay agricultura sin caza, no hay ganadería sin caza. Hace años la agricultura y la ganadería y la caza había un cierto desencuentro, pero todo el mundo ha llegado a la conclusión de que la caza es importante para el mantenimiento de la agricultura y la ganadería. Eh, solo tienen que recordar la pandemia del COVID-19 y el gran trabajo que hicieron los agricultores para poder alimentar a la población. En aquella ocasión, el Gobierno español recurrió a los cazadores. Recurrió a los cazadores para que controlásemos las eh, sobrepoblaciones de conejos y jabalíes que mermaban los, los cultivos. Por tanto, eh, es obvio la, la, la importancia de la caza en ese control poblacional. En cuanto a la ganadería, eh, además de, de ese control que se hace de la transmisión de enfermedades de animales salvajes a animales domésticos, eh, es una herramienta fundamental para el control de los grandes carnívoros. En España, el lobo ha matado en 2021 más de 10.200 animales domésticos. Es obvio que muchas explotaciones ganaderas económicamente no son ya rentables y se están abandonando las explotaciones ganaderas en España. Es evidente que si Europa sigue planteando esas políticas pseudoecologistas y urbanas alejadas del mundo rural y de sus tradiciones, los pocos habitantes que quedan en nuestros pueblos se verán obligados a marcharse. Por no hablar de los accidentes de tráfico en España, 11.500 accidentes de tráfico con animales de caza mayor. Por no hablar del control poblacional del jabalí con esa amenaza de la peste porcina que sobrevuela ya por todos los países europeos. En España el, 80, el 87% del territorio es territorio de caza. Como decíamos, genera 250.000 empleos. 
eh, empleos en el mundo rural imprescindibles para que en un lugar donde hay pocas oportunidades se siga manteniendo, se siga manteniendo una, la, la población. Muchos de los ayuntamientos de España, eh, su, el 75% de sus ingresos proviene de la caza, con lo cual limitar la actividad llevaría a la ruina de muchos de los ayuntamientos que, que gobiernan lo, los pueblos de, de España. Eh, la limitación en la actividad cinegética conllevaría eh, el cierre de empresas vinculadas a la caza, el cierre de hoteles, restaurantes, gasolineras, todo lo que es un entramado económico y social que mantiene nuestros pueblos. Algo así ocurrirá si eh, progresa la iniciativa legislativa que en España se está debatiendo hoy en el Congreso de los Diputados. El viernes estaremos, la Federación Española, en el Congreso para defender eh, a la caza la ley de protección, derechos y bienestar de los animales, que además de prohibir directamente cazas tradicionales, nos va a impedir utilizar animales auxiliares para cazar, con lo cual no podremos cazar con perros y la caza sin perros pues deja de existir. Una ley que, que nos llevó a la calle el 20 de marzo, creo que el presidente puede dar fe de aquella gran movilización, de aquel hito histórico que, que, que llevó a la calle a casi un millón de personas para defender el mundo rural, la ganadería, la agricultura y, por supuesto, la caza. Sí, pues, Europa no puede ser, no puede ser miope. Europa no, debe legislar escuchando tanto a la, al mundo urbano como al mundo rural y solamente así se podrá frenar el abandono de nuestros pueblos. Europa no puede prohibir el silvestrismo, no puede prohibir la casta sostenible de la tórtola, no puede prohibir el uso del plomo sin una alternativa viable, no puede seguir aumentando los espacios protegidos con el único afán de prohibir los usos y costumbres que han mantenido a lo largo de siglos los espacios protegidos. En España tenemos un grave problema con la Red Natura 2000. Ahora eh, los gobernantes se están dando cuenta que eh, los espacios protegidos limitan impiden el desarrollo de los pueblos y, por tanto, ahora estamos en revisar, intentar revisar los espacios protegidos que hay en nuestro país y, sin embargo, Europa va en la dirección contraria. Ahora quiere más espacios protegidos. O sea, esto es, es, un, es un contrasentido. Y luego vemos cómo en los espacios protegidos la biodiversidad cada vez decae más. Vemos que invertimos miles de euros en proteger aves esteparias y las aves esteparias se están extinguiendo. O sea, algo se está haciendo mal y yo creo que los datos, eh, los datos cantan. ¿no? Así pues, las instituciones europeas tienen el deber y la obligación de legislar para todos los ciudadanos. Solo así seremos un continente unido, fuerte, donde la gente que quiera vivir en el campo pueda vivir en él. Porque hay que recordar, y hay que recordar a las instituciones europeas, que si el campo no produce, la ciudad no come. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, Manuel Gallardo, President of the Royal Spanish Hunting Federation. Next up, we have uh, Linda Dombrovska, who was a Vice President of FACE for the Baltic region. You are very welcome, Linda. Thank you, David. Uh, Mr. President, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would uh, like to tell you that uh, nowadays we live in a very interesting world. And I will give you an example. If you want to go and get a surgery, you ask for a doctor. If people want to go to space, uh, they talk to scientists or astronauts. But when there are issues about hunting, Everybody has an opinion, and usually they don't ask the opinion of the hunters. They suppose that they think what we do, and what we think, and how we feel. And in many cases, it's quite interesting for me to find out what other people think I actually feel when I go hunting. 
So this campaign, Sign for Hunting, is a chance for us, first time on the EU level, to show everyone that our opinions matter, that hunting is really important even nowadays in the 21st century. Latvian Minister of Agriculture, Mr. Gerhards, uh, recently said to contact hunters and say, help us please. So why is this campaign so important? Uh, because this is our chance, the chance for hunters to say to society and the institutions that our opinion matters and that our voices should be heard. And that's why every single signature of every hunter is so important. The decisions taken about biodiversity, about nature, about environment, and about hunting should not be reached based on emotions, but they should be reached based on facts and solid signs. And hunters have loads of solid signs. We have lots of good practices and FACE is doing incredible work by collecting all these practices and uh, putting them out and showing the society what hunters are actually doing for nature and for environment. And this is also a great chance for us to explain to society, to non-hunters, what hunting is all about. For example, in Sweden, Almost 90% of society are pro-hunting. They say hunting is good, hunting is great, and hunting is important. Uh, and this is an example uh, for the fact that uh, society understands that hunting uh, is about biological diversity and about healthy lifestyle. So I would say it's our future. It's a chance for children not to sit at the computers and play video games. It's a chance to be outside, to enjoy nature, uh, to enjoy fresh air and healthy food. So I ask all the hunters in Europe to take just a few seconds to sign this campaign and to say that our voice actually matters. Thank you very much and let's go hunting. Thank you very much, Linda, FACE Vice President for the Baltic region. Next up, we have Christopher Grafius, who is uh, on one hand chair of the FACE Communications Working Group, but also the executive director of communications for the British Association for Shooting and Conservation. So you're very welcome, Christopher. Thank you, David. It may surprise you that a British speaker should appear at a European press conference. Many of you might expect me to be standing out there in the courtyard with blinkers on, my earplugs in, and a gag. That is until you remember that 80% of the game shot in the United Kingdom is exported to Europe. Europe is in love with the taste of British pheasant, partridge, and venison. And also remember that when we Brexited, we adopted into British legislation, European legislation. So our habitats regulations are currently the same as yours. We have duplicated the European reach process in a UK reach process. So just as for you, 80% of our laws that affect us are coming from those laws that we have adopted from you. And without representation by members of the European Parliament from the UK or by British commissioners, we need to be closer to Europe because it would be naive for us to think that what you do in Europe about hunting will not affect shooting in the UK. So remember that difference. When you talk about hunting, we talk about shooting. And I want to underline that so you'll understand what I have to say in the future. The business of politics 
the business of good governance, the business of good administration, is not to represent the people who shout loudest and complain most. It is there to represent the citizens wherever they come from. Decent governance is about the representation and respect for minority interests. It's about a concern for the people who may not be waving banners in the street. And that is my main message to you. Seven million hunters in Europe are seven million votes. But they're more than that. Because for every hunter, there are people who work in hunting, people who help in hunting, people who benefit from hunting by eating the food it produces. And they are voters too. So this is a key constituency. And it's not only a rural constituency. It would be a great mistake for politicians to think that this is only about people who live in remote places in the countryside. It's also about people who live where the chimneys are. If I look at the UK, most of our hunters live in the towns, suburbs and villages and go out to the countryside for their recreation. And I imagine that is the same throughout Europe. So hunters are a force in every electoral district. The second thing to say is that hunters want a healthy environment. There is no good hunting without a healthy environment. And that is why we put so much into conservation. In the United Kingdom, hunters put a quarter of a million pounds a year into conservation, millions of work hours, and the equivalent of 16,000 privately funded conservation jobs. If you want to do conservation on a landscape scale, you cannot do it without hunters because they are the people who walk the land every day. They're the people who know what's on the land and they have a personal interest in ensuring that the land and the wildlife that feeds on it benefits. And that is an alliance for preserving the environment that every administration and every government needs. So my message to those who are listening is talk to hunters, because by working with them, working with the people who know the countryside, know the environment, you will achieve the goals of a better environment, a healthy environment, and good wildlife. And that is always going to be better, that working together, than the sort of disunion and argument that we see in politics now. I look forward to that day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christopher Graffius. Next up, we move to Italy, and we have our Vice President for Italy, Mr. Gianluca Delaglio, and he is going to give a short intervention. So you're very welcome to the podium. Merci, Président. Merci, David. Bonjour à tous. J'ai quelques notes. Euh, ma... <rire> je serai bref. Hein, Alors, <coughs> je dois parler en français. Je m'excuse surtout avec, euh, avec Willy <rire> de mon français. Ce n'est pas ma langue. Je parle déjà mal l'italien, figurez-vous, le français. Bon, euh, euh, le titre de, de, de la relation, c'est « Construire la Syrie ». C'est technique, c'est très technique. Et, et la rente la politique, c'est un peu difficile. Bon. La, construire la Syrie, est factuelle pour la chasse durable. Bon, 
la sas durable est un, un concept, ou disons mieux, un contenant culturel, un coffre mobile, et c'est le sasseur à lui donner un sens et une valeur adaptative aux réalités sociales, culturelles, environnementales des références. La construction des bases concrètes pour la sas durable est en même temps une somme d'objectifs inaliénables, dont certains se réalisent progressivement, peut-être aujourd'hui moins concrètement que prévu, et aujourd'hui on a, et la face on a, nous a renseigné ça, de progresser pour rejoindre mieux et plus vite euh, la durabilité de la SAS. Et les, les contenus sont, euh, euh, sont étroitement, liés, étroitement liés et conditionnés par l'homme, par la société, par la nature et plutôt par la biodiversité et la faune. Mais pour progresser en ordre, pourquoi la SAS durable devrait être un objectif concret indispensable et rejoint avec moins de gradualité par rapport au présent Car la SAS, avec le pastoralisme et l'agriculture, c'est un patrimoine de l'homme qu'il faut maintenir. Et dans le même temps, elle est le plus ancien moyen d'utilisation des ressources de la nature. Et aujourd'hui, Malheureusement, mais c'est comme ça, l'éthique environnementale et la chasse sont considérées comme des termes antithétiques et une forte contradiction. Nous vivons une époque caractérisée par une nouvelle dichotomie, celle entre l'homme en tant qu'auteur de son propre progrès et la disponibilité et l'utilisation des ressources naturelles. Aujourd'hui, on parle de rendre à la planète plus ses plus que c'est nous lui prenons, et du développement productif et économique dissocié de l'utilisation des ressources naturelles. Point interrogatif. L'état d'équilibre dans lequel se trouvera la relation entre les progrès économiques et l'utilisation des ressources en sens général eh, naturel déterminera la qualité future de notre mode de vie et dépendra d'une mesure absolue du degré de durabilité de nos choix. Et en même temps, la qualité future de la façon de pratiquer et de vivre la culture de la SAS dépendra également du niveau de durabilité et de la vitesse à laquelle les citoyens s'assurent et les associations de, et les associations de s'assurent et la FAS décideront progressivement de la adopter et de les adapter dans le cadre d'une vision dynamique et clairvoyante avec une mission que la FAS nous a renseignée que la face est là, il guide, et dans une mission en ce sens cohérente. Le changement et le renforcement de l'identité et de la considération de la SAS et des stations dans une société de modernité liquide, dont les changements soudains et continus semblent être les seuls, la seule chose permanente, compliquent la déclinaison des contenus de la durabilité et leur adaptation à la société. Le débat, dans ce sens, est déjà ouvert depuis un certain temps. Il y a <coughs> des excellents exemples dans lesquels l'acceptation de la SAS dans la société à travers une déclination attentive et historique de la durabilité et on a obtenu un fait, ça c'est un fait établi, tout comme il y a des autres situations qui sont moins évoluées dans ce sens. En même temps, la protection légitime des intérêts de la SAS, des fois, il faut le dire, je le dis, et, et, ne doit pas être confondu avec la défense de l'indéfendable. En bref, il y a des critères de durée. Non, je ne non, non, l'interprète. Ah, excusez-moi, je, je, je me rends Déjà aujourd'hui, mais autant plus dans un sens prospectif, nous avons besoin, en tant qu'organisation des SAS, d'être perçus comme participants à une activité concrète et utile, 
comme un rôle social des valeurs économiques estimables qui répondent aux intérêts généraux du système national et du système européen, face à l'utilisation de la face. Face à l'utilisation la, de la faune, une ressource qui, des fois, n'est pas facilement renouvelable. Les chasseurs qui deviennent un opérateur de la biodiversité protagoniste de l'environnement, c'est un nouveau profil, déjà actuel, une nouvelle histoire, une nouvelle narration une nouvelle vision pour l'avenir de la chasse en faveur d'une gestion active de l'environnement. La conservation de la biodiversité n'est pas une activité théorique, détachée de la réalité, mais doit être contextualisée, au moins dans certains aspects interdépendants entre eux, l'aspect social, l'aspect culturel, l'aspect économique et l'aspect environnemental. Le fil rouge de l'avenir sera constitué par des politiques de conservation des ressources environnementales fondées sur la connaissance biologique et naturaliste les plus récentes et sur l'application des techniques appropriées et prédictives, favorisant une approche multidisciplinaire. Mais où se situe la durabilité de la SAS et de sa fonction Elle se suit dans le domaine de la gestion active de la faune, qui ne peut pas être séparé d'une connaissance formative optimale et des opérations sur le terrain. La gestion de la biodiversité nécessite des personnes compétentes, un chasseur entraîné, et nous avons des chasseurs très entraînés. Aujourd'hui, la possibilité d'interaction entre l'homme contemporain et la nature sont de plus en plus réduites. Par contre, la possibilité d'interaction de l'homme chasseur avec la nature n'ont jamais diminué. Ça, c'est une force. La biodiversité est considérée comme un bien commun et ceux qui la protègent jouent un rôle important sur le plan social et économique. Une période de crise, et nous sommes dans une petite période de crise, il est possible de mieux travailler pour promouvoir des révolutions culturelles et comportementales appropriées. Les chasseurs formés par leur organisation sont déjà engagés à soutenir la biodiversité. Les réalités qui ont géré systématiquement cette question enrichie par une expertise technique et scientifique ont obtenu des résultats très significatifs, les plus importants étant l'implication, la sensibilisation et l'évolution conséquente d'autres chasseurs. Un chasseur évolué est le plus souvent un chasseur moins frustré, plus conscient et plus actif dans sa gestion. Les techniciens de la SAS engagés à différents niveaux sont aussi et surtout les, prom et, et surtout les promoteurs d'une nouvelle prise de conscience et d'une évolution de la SAS dans la société, ainsi qu'au sein du monde de la SAS. À cet égard, il faut rappeler que l'exemple d'excellence et de gestion de la biodiversité et de la faune, et pas seulement celle sassable, peuvent être objet de, de, de promotion et d'émulation dans les territoires où la gestion de la biodiversité et de la faune naturelle est sporadique ou des fois absente. En même temps, l'objectif de la durabilité devrait être d'ouvrir des moments de confront même des moments de confrontation entre les chasseurs et les autres composantes sociales, ou dans un horizon plus large avec des visions différentes du monde de la nature, euh, entre les parties prenantes et de la faune. Il pourrait tendre à la médiation des intérêts afin de vivre de manière respectueuse, mais aussi, si possible, constructive, jusqu'à imaginer des possibles alliances non utopiques et utile aux humains, à la faune, au système et à la planète. Existe une ligne permanente et toujours tracée entre le passé, le présent et le futur. La ligne de l'histoire et de l'évolution de l'humanité, qui concerne tous les humains, en particulier leur comportement, qui, lorsqu'il est consolidé par une conviction, est difficile à modifier. Eh bien, 
pour retourner à notre monde et à mon monde et à la chasse et à la durabilité de la même, je crois que la ligne de l'évolution comportementale a été éclairée et activée grâce à les chasseurs, grâce à la face. Et ça, on peut le porter à la connaissance de la société civile et même de l'Europe. Il existe une relation proche entre l'évolution comportementale et la, le, la rédemption, permettez le terme, sociale, que les chercheurs ont su interpréter et qui aujourd'hui on peut la raconter. Enfin, C'est pour les raisons exposées que j'ai écoutées ce matin dans les différents rapports que la face a entendu organiser la campagne pour présenter l'identité de la chasse conservatrice aux institutions à l'avenir et les faire mieux connaître et obtenir une acceptation et une compréhension possible, une compréhension plus favorable dans les institutions européennes. Merci. Very good. Thank you, Jean-Luc Delalio, from uh, our vice president from Italy. We have been around Europe and we've had um, some different perspectives on this campaign in the context of building a stronger Europe together, why Brussels must work with Europe's 7 million hunters. And what came out really was the importance of hunting for society, the importance of hunting environmentally in terms of our conservation role, the importance of hunting also economically, and importantly, the importance of hunting culturally. And I think we've had some clear common themes in that we are partners when it comes to delivering the EU's conservation agenda. Work with us and we need to have um, fair play. And that goes into the heart of why this campaign is alive now. We have some time and thank you to the speakers for being uh, on time. Uh, and we will have a political perspective by uh, Mr. Juan Ignacio Zoido uh, shortly. But let's open the floor for some comments, questions, and we can be, we can be quite uh, dynamic. It is also live streamed, so perhaps we have some questions coming online. Uh, and I'll ask one of my colleagues to grab the microphone, uh, Alessio or Jenny. Okay, first question. Just please bear with us while we get you a microphone. So how does it work? Does it work? Yes, perfect. <laughs> Great. Hello, my name is Peter Husen and I'm representing today the European Association of the uh, Civil Commerce of Weapons. Uh, so we are basically, or our members are basically the uh, the shops where your hunters can purchase ammunition, rifles, and other equipments. And uh, of course, we very closely follow all those political discussions on very concrete hunting issues. But we also like to advise that there are other proposals in the pipeline of European regulators, which will also have a severe impact on your members. And I'm talking about the European firearms regulation. A new proposal by the European Commission is overdue. It should have been presented already earlier this year. And there might be even plans for a firearms directive revision, although this has not been in the EU Commission work program for the coming year. However, these legislations will affect our members, but your members as well, because they basically regulate how weapons can be purchased, 
how many weapons can be purchased and uh, what the potential buyers, what requirements they have to fulfill. And we will have this uh, discussion in the coming months and we will, well, hoping to work closely also on this issue together with your members and of course also to uh, together with the European um, Hunting Association with FACE. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the for the comment. Um, and we didn't reflect much on the uh, EU's approach when it comes to firearms and the firearms directive. So it's good this is introduced. I can say from the perspective of hunters, um, the importance of um, really uh, approaching, for example, a potential future revision of the firearms directive based on what we learned last time, that proposals need to be grounded in evidence. And we certainly saw some issues from the perspective of hunters in terms of proposals for changing the minimum age, uh, and proposals for um, uh, uh, testing, etc. I think from the perspective of the European hunting community, we came out of that process, um, I think, reasonably well. Um, and I won't go into detail. The great challenge now is the uh, correct implementation by member states. So there seems to be a lot of challenges <clears throat> at national level in implementing the directive. And um, from an industry perspective, you know the big issues you face with marking of all essential components, uh, etc. Uh, when we're when we're talking about Brussels, I think uh, one of the uh, proposals that we fought for many many years ago in face was the European Firearms Pass. And that's definitely one of the things we can say it is a success story. You can move freely with your firearms for hunting and sport shooting around Europe. Implementation isn't perfect um, in some countries, for example, Sweden. Um, but nevertheless, uh, this is important. It's one of the, the benefits. And I think when we look towards the revision of the firearms regulation, um, we could easily uh, envisage a, a digitalization of the European Firearms Pass. But we can hope that any approach to uh, firearms in the context of, of, of Europe's hunters, it should be fair, it should be proportionate, it should be balanced. Um, and the comments have been made um, throughout. When you're often talking about hunting, there are many, many voices. And you're often talking about something that's emotive. And you can have the same dynamic with firearms. Um, it can be a very emotional topic with some very personal views. But we can only... Uh, part of the campaign is really... Um, the principles of the campaign are perfectly aligned with a, a pragmatic approach to anything the European Union does when it comes to firearms. And I would hope the same would apply to our colleagues in the, in the industry. So thank you for raising that point. Okay, we have a number of hands raised. Um, well, they have the microphone. You have the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say, um, like the previous speaker, please uh, give yourself a short introduction okay. before you pose um, a question. Okay, I come from Malta, the smallest member state of the European Union. My name is Joe Perici Calascione. I have been involved in the Federation for Hunting and Conservation for many, many years, much longer than I wish to remember. Our collaboration with FACE has been steadfast for many years, and I would like to thank the President and yourself for giving us this opportunity to express ourselves. My problem with the European Union is not the European Union, it's the interpretation of the directives that they give, especially to situations like ours. Whoever wrote the directive was a genius. He gave the opportunity to everyone to be able to derogate for a particular and specific circumstance. Unfortunately, every time we try to apply a derogation for what I would call regional hunting practices that affect a small group of people and an even smaller number of game species, it is being put down with all possible manners by the interpretation of the directive. We are 18 years into the European Union. We are 18 years into a system whereby we evolved from what we were to what we are today, trying to implement each paragraph, each word of the directive in a manner as to appease 
the commission uh, and also abiding by the guidance document issued by the commission itself. And then we find ourselves faced with situations whereby what we try to implement, what we try to do in terms of the directive, what, is it, what it is saying, we, are find, we found ourselves to be doing the wrong thing always. So my, my statement rather than question is, why is it that anything that is done by hunters and when you look at hunters in Malta, you are talking about a very small island with very small countryside space. We plant thousands of trees. Our federation implements the, the, the planting of trees from seedlings, native trees, uh, to replace in, uh, alien species that have been planted by, by our predecessors. We take care of the countryside. We, we are there when fires occur. We are there when storms occur to rebuild the rubble wars that, that give life to thousands of species. Why, uh, instead of being with us, uh, the commission is always trying to put these people aside in a way that if we are lost, if the hunters are lost, Malta will become even more a block of white stone. So I thank you for this opportunity and I would encourage every single hunter from every single country to sign this petition because they are signing it for themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the comment. Um, I think you explained the situation um, very well. I don't think it needs a response uh, or any clarity. So um, uh, thank you for that. Um, and to note, the campaign is running very well in Malta in terms of the number of hunters and the percentage of hunters that have signed it um, are certainly on the on the leaderboard. Uh, we have some more questions. I think our <coughs> colleagues from Ireland, please. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and President John Butler, uh, Secretary of Face Ireland and Chairman of our National Association of Regional Game Councils. Um, in Ireland, Chairman, we are nervous. We are nervous of the European Commission. Uh, we are nervous uh, for the future of our culture, our heritage, and our sport. And uh, that is the reason why we are urging people to sign now for uh, the European Hunters Campaign. We feel very, very strong about it because the reason we have to do this is to seek democracy. And we're in a, a, a democratic uh, society, and hunting plays a major part and role in that society. And what we are looking for is to be treated equally within Europe. And um, if we look back at the recent past, we have to ask ourselves, have we been treated fairly? Have we been given equal opportunity? Have hunters got confidence in institutions like the REACH and ECA and the, the people that are determining the future of our sport? And that's the question that we pose today to the European Commission. Are we going to be assured of fair play into the future for to ensure that our culture, our heritage and our sport is protected and guarded, not alone for us, but for our future generations to come behind us? Thanks, Chairman. Thank you very much. And the REACH process is one where we feel we haven't seen fair play. And that's why we've had to use um, the European Ombudsman to get access to information um, and to even uh, alter the entire process for a consultation to be reopened. Um, and I can only reflect again about the problems that were really unnecessary in the context of the reach restriction on lead shot over wetlands. 24 member states have laws in place, um, but the uh, law that comes into effect in February next year is going to be a major challenge for implementation. That's just not the view of FACE, that's the view of the enforcement form of the European Chemicals Agency. It was also the view of almost half of the European Parliament as well. So I think the request for fair play, the ask for, for fair play is very relevant in the context of uh, what will happen under the REACH regulation. That will, it's unique, 
directly affect every single hunter in Europe. So it's of utmost importance that uh, fairness is uh, at play. Thank you very much. Uh, there were some more hands. Um, Daniel, please, and please introduce yourself first. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Is it working? Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Daniel Schwerchula. I'm from Czech Hunting Association. And uh, I have a question regarding large carnivores. In recent years, we can see a successful uh, uh, story of large carnivores in Europe. They are growing in numbers. Of course, we know we have uh, directives. They are giving us some flexibility, but I'm wondering whether we, we can even use this flexibility because you can see in some countries where they were regulating large carnivores and the numbers were increasing. At some point now, it's not allowed anymore. And it's a big challenge for many countries now. So I'm asking what, what are we going to do about it? Uh, because I think maybe we should move a bit forward and uh, try to make uh, some some changes for future before it's too late again. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. This is one of our core work areas um, and we're, say, uh, supportive of the conservation of large carnivores. And we know where large carnivore populations have been doing very well. It's because of a very long tradition of game and hunting and wildlife management. Um, what we're seeing now is a, a real problem in the context of large carnivore management where we have some successful models like the Lynx in Latvia, there has been a breakdown. Uh, but we're also seeing the same breakdown in the Baltic uh, and the Nordic countries. So the very successful management of brown bear, for example, in Finland, that's also breaking down. The challenge is with the interpretation around Annex 4 of the Habitats Directive. We have a new guidance document. We don't believe it provides that additional clarity necessary. Um, and what we are seeing is more and more momentum by member states in the Agri-Fish Council uh, and also the European Parliament to call for a procedure to amend the annexes of the Habitats Directive where populations have reached favourable status. This isn't about opening the annexes of the Habitats Directive. This is really a special focus on large carnivores. Uh, the other important aspects, when it comes to the reporting and monitoring of large carnivores, there needs to be, we feel, uh, a more adequate procedure at the EU level. The biogeographical reporting is putting large carnivore populations in artificial categories. We need to move more towards uh, population level uh, and transboundary level approaches to monitoring, conservation and management. And there is an opportunity there for um, member states. So that's uh, a, a, li a little bit of context about where this is going. I think the a lot of discussion about flexibility over the years is largely disappearing. And I would add, it's not just in, uh, let's say, Annex 4. I should add that they are the populations that really need that level of flexibility to ensure that there can be good coexistence with those that are closest to large carnivores. Um, and there are some big attempts being made, but um, there are some great challenges as well. There is an infringement open against Sweden for more than a decade, and that creates some challenges for, for management. Um, so I think the momentum will move towards just a procedure to amend the annexes of the Habitats Directive. Um, that's not just the view of face. That seems to be the view now of, of more member states and the European Parliament in the absence of flexibility under, on, on, under the directive. Um, I can see our colleague from Romania wishes to take the floor. Please and in, introduce yourself first. Okay. Thank you. Ovidio Nescu. I don't think, yeah. Okay, Ovidio Nescu is my name. I'm the president of the Hunting Association from General Hunting Association of Romania. Practically, uh, David already answered to at least half of my question. So, 
I will uh, talk about uh, large carnivores and uh, the main problem in Romania are the bears. We have an overpopulation of bears, a success of conservation of large carnivores by the hunters, not by somebody else, not by conservationists, uh, but under these circumstances, because we stop hunting for more than six years, uh, hunting of bears. We have bears everywhere in agriculture fields, in the villages, in the towns, and uh, the reaction of the local people start to appear because they saw that they cannot solve the problem, so they solve the problem by themselves. This means poisoning the bear, illegally killing the bears in order to get rid of this nuisance. So whatever was a value for the hunters, for hunting, for the economy, became now a failure and the population is going down. So under these circumstances, I think it's very important to have very clear principles. When we have a population of whatever, in this case, large carnivore, in a favorable conservation status defined by European Commission, to be able to take the necessary measure in order to have an active management of this species and not a pro-reactive management. So we are allowed to kill a bear if he is killing a man. Think about, we have in the last three years, about eight people killed up by bears, more than 70 people per year, more than 70 people in hospitals, and bears which are killed in uh, traffic accidents, more than 70, 72 this year already killed in traffic accidents. And uh, what is this is what we discover. So we would like to, uh, and we are very happy that in the phase strategy we have this, to have clear principles about how we manage population, overabundant population. We don't speak about a species which is endangered. Thank you very much. Thank you very much from our member from Romania. Next speaker, and please give yourself a short introduction. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Dusan Krajniak from uh, Slovakia. I heard a colleague from Romania, and I uh, heard that the situation is the same in the Slovakia. We have a lot of bear. Uh, we have a good management plan where it's written that regulation is possible. But our uh, green government, our Ministry of Environmental said no. We have a wolf at Annex 4. We can regulate it. But the Ministry of uh, Environment say this uh, spring that it is not possibility. What we can to do when uh, is uh, our government not work together with decision of European Commission. Thank you very much. It's yet another example of um, the challenges we face with large carnivores. And to just to stress, we have uh, in our uh, nine points in our petition, we have one very clear and concise point on what we want in the context of large carnivores. And that's what we are working towards. Okay, next um, comment, and please give yourself a short introduction. My name is Rejko Zerjao, I'm coming from Slovenia, and I would like to update you on a situation with large carnivores in Slovenia. We have a steadily growing population of brown bear and exploding population of wolf. Uh, both obviously are on the Annex 4, which means we are in trouble. Uh, the bears at the moment uh, have the biggest population, uh, density population in the world. We have over 1,200 bears and uh, after five years uh, when ministry issued a decree to cull a certain number, not to reduce the population but to reduce the growth of population, uh, first time when the Greens gave this uh, legislation to court, asked experts to come and to give the evidence. There were professors from university, researchers and so on, 
And first time the judge listened to them. And first time the judge said, go on, reduce the population. It's uh, really a breaking point. Uh, I hope that uh, this reality went over to the general population because uh, some people believe that bears are very nice and they should come to every living room. But unfortunately, it's not so easy. We are happy to have bears, we are happy to have wolves, and we want to keep them, but in a normal, let's say, uh, manageable uh, density. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's going into the heart of some of the challenges with um, Annex 4 uh, large carnivore populations. Uh, and in some member states, we know every single derogation that's issued is ending up in the court. And that's why it's so um, important that we find a way. And member states have the same legal obligation to ensure favorable status in Annex 5, but without the bureaucratic nightmare that we're seeing in some member states. Okay, next question, please, and uh, provide a short intro. Good up, good good morning to everybody. I'm Michele Sorrenti. I'm the chairman of Bird and Habitat Working Group in FACE. I would like to give uh, two points, uh, one about uh, wolves in Italy that has the biggest population in Europe. The recent estimate uh, produced by our institute is about uh, 3,600 uh, as a minimum in Italy. If from other experts, the number could be uh, higher. Um, the new possible good things is that a national action plan, national management plan of wolf in Italy is in discussion in these months uh, between regions and central authorities and uh, derogation are present in the text so there is a debate obviously between the central authorities that as i heard from other countries is the same want to restrict these possibilities but the regions are uh, in these last years and months uh, full of problems between the uh, cattle uh, raiser uh, owners uh, and uh, many many um, of these people raising livestock are uh, stopping in the Alps or uh, in Appennino because of this uh, continued attacks by wolves and this is also a, a problem of biodiversity because this kind of uh, livestock uh, grazing uh, not intensive but extensive uh, without fences is an in produce an increase in uh, uh, grasses and uh, take under control the woods uh, the growing of woods and so that is clearly linked to the presence of some particular breeding birds so i think that an, an argument that everybody can everybody face can show but also national authorities is that a good uh, coexistence between uh, grazing of livestock uh, is uh, also a good point in biodiversity. This is what is happening in Italy. I have another small point as a suggestion for the problem of um, request for the commission of the increase of uh, protected areas because I feel in the mind in the, in the speaking of anti-hunting people and unfortunately in many politicians following this philosophy is that nature had to regulate itself alone uh, which is obviously untrue and it's a problem i think we can prepare some example that show where nature is left alone to regulate itself and all raise uh, woods or uncontrolled vegetation and properly managed by hunters areas. That could be a very nice example for public opinion and for politicians that probably have another point to hurt our arguments. Thank you. Thank you, Michele. Yes, um, next uh, question and please uh, in, uh, give yourself a short intro.
Yes, uh, Lino Farrugia, I am the um, Chief Executive of the Maltese Federation for Hunting Conservation and Vice President for the Mediterranean region in FACE. Um, we've heard a lot of complaints um, from large carnivores to birds to everything. And uh, the common factor in all this problem is the commission, in my opinion. I mean, we try to give the commission what they want. We, 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 we produce solutions, scientific solutions. But as was discussed even at yesterday's uh, General Council, they always come back wanting more. They are never satisfied. So that's why, in my opinion, this petition is of the utmost importance because maybe, maybe the commission will listen to reason uh, at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good being conscious of time and um, very pleased to welcome our um, uh, a political perspective on this debate, uh, Mr. Juan Ignacio Zoido. We have uh, in interpretation should should you need. Um, we have been summarizing the uh, challenges that we're facing in the context of um, um, hunting and conservation in Europe uh, with respect to the European Hunters Campaign. And a number of themes have come out here, uh, in particular, the important role of hunting to nature, to people, to economies, and the important role culturally. Uh, and the main message is that um, decision makers need to work with Europe's hunting community. We are really partners. And we have a huge policy agenda in front of us um, that can deliver good for biodiversity. And we will be active players in terms of ensuring this works, like the common agricultural policy, the new reform, uh, like the new work on protected areas in Europe. We need to be seen at the Brussels level and at the national level as partners. And the same will apply to new initiatives on soil and forestry. These are key policies where uh, we need to be seen as partners. Um, and we've discussed a wide range of other examples where fair play is needed. But at this point, I'm delighted to um, invite a member of the European Parliament, uh, Mr. Juan Ignacio Zoido, to give a, a short address to this press conference, providing uh, a political perspective. So, uh, Mr. Zoido, you're, you're very welcome to take the floor. Thank you. Buenos días a todos. En primer lugar, quiero darle las gracias a, a FACE por haberme invitado a poder estar hoy aquí con, con todos vosotros eh, y poder eh, compartir con vosotros una serie de reflexiones que como persona, como eurodiputado, pero como cazador también tengo. Y por tanto, os doy las gracias sinceramente y también quiero agradecer porque todos tenemos nuestro corazoncito. Yo quiero agradecer aquí a dos personas que también se encuentran aquí con nosotros. Quiero saludar al presidente de la Federación Española de Caza en mi país materno, a Manuel. Muchas gracias por estar hoy aquí y por representar a tantos miles y millones de cazadores españoles y también, como no, al presidente de la Federación Extremeña, a José María, que también se encuentra aquí. Y también a todos ustedes. Como político y como cazador es un honor estar rodeado de los representantes de más de 7 millones de cazadores en toda Europa. Sobre todo cuando compartimos un objetivo tan noble como es el de preservar la naturaleza y contribuir 
a la sociedad y a la economía rural, como acababa de estar hablando aquí quien me ha precedido en el uso de la palabra. Presidente, una contribución en España como preservar la naturaleza y contribuir al desarrollo de la economía rural es evidente. El, 38, el 87% del territorio en mi país ha sido declarado de aprovechamiento cinegético y con magníficos ejemplares de caza, tanto mayor como menor. Como todos ustedes saben, la preocupación por la sostenibilidad es ahora una de las grandes prioridades políticas y es una preocupación que yo comparto y que todos vosotros también compartís y estoy seguro que así se lo trasladaremos a todos aquellos a quienes nosotros representamos. Pero hay mucha gente que olvidan que la sostenibilidad siempre se basa en tres ámbitos. El medioambiental, pero también el social y el económico. Y la caza es un ejemplo de este equilibrio sostenible que tenemos que alcanzar. ¿Por qué digo que este, estas tres patas de la sostenibilidad hay que mantenerla? Pues muy sencillo, porque la caza tiene una gran contribución social en cada uno de los países. Hay 800.000 cazadores en España. Es el tercer deporte más practicado en mi país, después del fútbol y el baloncesto. Y es que la caza es un deporte, pero además es mucho más. Es una forma de vivir, es una forma de entender la naturaleza, es una, es una forma de desarrollar la familia y la vida en el entorno rural. Digo que es una contribución social porque se materializa en la educación, ya que enseña a los jóvenes a respetar y a valorar la naturaleza. Seguridad vial, ya que evita accidentes en carreteras convencionales por la sobrepoblación de algunas especies y por los daños irreparables que pueden causar. Contribuye también socialmente porque reduce los siniestros agrícolas de jabalí, gamos o ciervos, reduciendo a su vez la demanda de subvenciones de agricultores por los daños que se producen en sus cultivos. Y tiene también una contribución social porque sobre todo la caza es un patrimonio cultural y crea un arraigo social siendo una pieza clave para la recuperación de aquellos municipios como pasa en mi país, en España, que están en un gravísimo riesgo de despoblación y, por tanto, de desaparición. Pero hay otra vertiente, junto con la social, la vertiente económica, porque la, ca la caza también supone un ingreso económico muy importante. En España la caza supone el 13% del PIB anual de todo el sector de la agricultura, la ganadería y la pesca genera más de 5.000 millones de euros al año y crea más de 187.000 puestos de trabajo. Además, la carne de caza está muy valorada en la alta cocina y supone un ingreso adicional para la población rural, sobre todo en los países nórdicos, en Europa del Este y también en mi país. Además de estas dos vertientes, que era la económica y la social, está la medioambiental. ¿Y por qué digo esto? Porque la caza tiene una gran contribución medioambiental. Los cazadores hacen, hacemos, una labor silenciosa de conservación y ayudan a alcanzar el compromiso ecológico por parte del sector rural. En España, la actividad cinegética invierte cerca de 300 millones de euros al año en la conservación y mantenimiento de hábitats naturales. Años y años de datos indican que en las regiones donde existe interés económico, los animales aumentan, ya que el dinero que generan desempeña un papel crucial en la restauración y conservación del hábitat, invirtiendo en acceso, pantano, poda, mejoras del monte, cortafuego o cortadero. O en vigilancia, 
o en la lucha contra las especies exóticas invasoras, o en la gestión de la fauna, evitando la sobrepoblación, la propagación de enfermedades entre especies y recoge muestras de animales para conocer más sobre ellos. Y finalmente, ayuda a la gestión de zonas protegidas. Y es que, señoras y señores, los cazadores siempre devolvemos mucho más de lo que cogemos. Y al que le interesa la caza trabaja para que haya más animales y para que la vegetación y el entorno cada día sea mejor. Sin embargo, siendo realista, la opinión pública cada vez entiende menos de caza y de sus beneficios. Y la imagen del cazador ha sido contaminada por el sensacionalismo y el buenismo animalista y la demagogia. Sé que son palabras crudas, pero que me gusta ser claro y sincero en lo que creo, en lo que pienso y en lo que quiero combatir y defender. Como consecuencia, cada vez se está recortando más el espacio del cazador y cada día se le ponen más complicaciones y más trabas burocráticas. Señoras y señores, se han aprobado ya medidas con difícil marcha atrás y tenemos que hablar de ellas para ver cómo las podemos combatir. Como por ejemplo la prohibición de la caza del lobo o la prohibición de la munición de plomo en humedales o la de la caza de la tórtola o igualmente otras normativas que están en proceso como es la prohibición de la importación de los trofeos de caza o de la posesión de, peso, de perros de reala. Voy a profundizar, aunque sea brevemente, en alguna de ellas. La prohibición de caza de los grandes carnívoros. Desde hace ya más de un año está prohibida la caza del lobo en casi toda Europa, excepto en algunos países como Rumanía y Bulgaria. En España, por ponerles un ejemplo, en la Sierra de la Culebra, algunas subastas llegaban a más de 6.000 euros por abatir un ejemplar, dinero que se reinvertía en la conservación y el mantenimiento de la propia sierra. Además, esta directiva olvida que los cazadores somos esenciales para la coexistencia pacífica entre las personas y los grandes carnívoros en zonas donde surgen conflictos que cada día son más. Y también olvida esta directiva el papel esencial que tenemos los cazadores para la conservación y la salud de estas poblaciones. Esta medida es un ejemplo de la humanización y la pseudosensibilidad que se ha implantado en la opinión pública, que no tiene para nada en cuenta la opinión de los expertos, los cazadores, y la gente que vive del campo. El mismo informe de la comisión, y voy a leer textualmente, y cito, dice, los habitantes del campo consideran que la caza es el método más importante para mejorar la convivencia, mientras que a nivel nacional se favorecen métodos alternativos para mejorar la convivencia. ¿Esto qué quiere decir? Pues que da la comisión más importancia a la gente de la ciudad que a los que viven en el campo. Conviven con el lobo y sufren las consecuencias de los ataques de esos grandes carnívoros. Es evidente que la comisión está equivocada, en mi opinión. Otro de los ejemplos que me parecen flagrantes y que surgen precisamente en mi país, en España es la que se ha llamado por el gobierno de mi país la Ley de Bienestar Animal. Esta nueva propuesta legislativa española obliga a los dueños de los perros de caza a inscribirse como criadores y a esterilizar a cualquier perro que pueda tener contacto con el exterior. Se olvidan de que ciertas razas de perros de caza, como los podencos o los dogos, no existirían si no fueran y hubieran cazadores. Además añade una burocracia y unos gastos innecesarios, es decir, lo que venimos denunciando 
desde hace mucho tiempo. Barrera tras barrera, trabas burocráticas y más trabas burocráticas cada día. Otro tema importante es la prohibición de la munición de plomo. Es un nuevo ataque a la actividad cinegética por parte de la Comisión Europea. Un estudio de la Federación Europea de Deportes de Tiro demostró que si se implementa hasta el final, uno de, cuatro, uno de cada cuatro cazadores dejaría de cazar y el 30% cazaría mucho menos. A nivel europeo, las pérdidas se podrían cuantificar en 5.700 millones de euros. Y esto sin contar con los costes de personal y de los cazadores de reemplazar sus armas de fuego. Además, el informe que publicó la Comisión no tiene base científica y culpa a la caza de la intoxicación de las aves terrestres, sin que llegaran ni a valorar, ni a sopesar, ni siquiera a considerar otros factores como son los vertederos, las minas o la contaminación por derivado del petróleo. Y hay además muchas más medidas que directa o indirectamente añaden complicaciones y burocracia a los cazadores. Y todo ello en lugar de aprovechar el apoyo inquebrantable que siempre han demostrado para el cuidado y el mantenimiento y mejora de la propia naturaleza. Aquí incluyo diferentes estrategias que son parte del Pacto Verde Europeo y que afectan también a nuestra actividad, como la Estrategia de la Biodiversidad, la Directiva de Hábitat o la Directiva de Aves. Casi todas vienen a pedir más acciones comunitarias dirigidas por los ciudadanos, empresas o interlocutores sociales para proteger y restaurar la naturaleza. Los cazadores podemos y queremos responder a esta petición, como aquí se estaba diciendo. Los cazadores no queremos estar al margen de todas estas iniciativas que se tienen que adoptar. Queremos que se adopten iniciativas y queremos ser protagonistas. Los cazadores no son el problema. Los cazadores son la parte importante de la solución del problema. Y eso es algo de lo que tenemos que tener un profundo convencimiento. Y así lo demuestran todos los datos europeos que analizan la larga actividad de los cazadores en la aplicación de las estrategias. Al fin y al cabo queremos lo mismo. Queremos zonas rurales sanas, ricas en biodiversidad y poblaciones de animales fuertes. Además, somos 7 millones de cazadores en Europa, que estamos y somos apasionados por nuestra forma de vida y con muchas ganas de poder continuar en esta forma de vida, con nuestra afición participando en que cada día la podamos fomentar en lugar de tener que estar dando tantas explicaciones. Así se vio el pasado mes de marzo en España. Cerca de medio millón de cazadores llegaron a la capital, a Madrid, en protesta por los ataques legislativos a los cazadores y al mundo rural que estaba produciendo el gobierno de mi país. Yo mismo tuve el honor de acompañarles, de protestar junto a ellos y ahora traigo sus reclamaciones hasta Bruselas y las defiendo cada vez que tengo la posibilidad de hacerlo, bien con enmienda, bien eh, interviniendo junto con otros europarlamentarios a los que vosotros también conocéis y creo que es la gran labor que tenemos que desarrollar y el compromiso que tenemos con nuestra sociedad. Y yo allí no estaba solo, porque allí estaban muchos de los que estáis hoy aquí, pero muy especialmente estaba el presidente de la Federación de Caza Española y el presidente de la Federación de Casa Extremeña, pero a quien me dio una gran satisfacción poder saludar y verlo allí, hacerme una foto y subirla a las redes sociales, es con el presidente de FACE, con el señor Larsa. Gracias por acompañarnos a tantos cazadores españoles que estaban siendo tratados de una manera injusta por parte del de gobierno de mi nación. Por eso, y yo para terminar... Quiero trasladaros que 
desde el partido que yo represento, vamos a seguir luchando para que los 7 millones de personas que somos aficionados a la caza tengamos voz. Para que esa voz pueda llegar a todas las instituciones para que se nos tenga en cuenta. Y es verdad que tendremos que organizarnos y organizarnos bien y dar la batalla. No es el momento de que estemos con complejos. Tenemos que estar asistidos de la razón. Para que nos den la razón tendremos que tener todos los informes que vayan a avalar las posturas que estamos manteniendo. Porque desgraciadamente la comisión está proliferando en una legislación sin contar con los informes de impacto que necesita cualquier normativa y que es necesario, por imperativo legal, que lo aporten cada vez que vayan a desarrollar un texto normativo. Y tenemos que oponernos a cada una de esas iniciativas y pedir que se rechace a la comisión y que lo vuelvan a mandar con el informe de impacto económico y medioambiental necesario. También tenemos que luchar, y, lo, y así lo hemos propuesto en nuestro partido, en nuestro grupo, para que se le deje de recortar el espacio a los cazadores, que podamos seguirnos organizando como grupo y para que no se nos añada más burocracia de la que ya se nos está añadiendo. Por eso vamos a trabajar para que las instituciones europeas, europeas en particular la Comisión, tenga esa visión objetiva y justa de la caza a la hora de aplicar políticas medioambientales. Y tenemos que estar todos juntos, los cazadores, mediante todas sus organizaciones y también aquellos que defendemos el deporte de la caza y que entendemos que haya otros que no lo quieran compartir, pero que igual que nosotros les respetamos a ellos, ellos tienen también la necesidad de respetarnos a nosotros. Porque tenemos que combatir la criminalización de la caza, que se está extendiendo desgraciadamente hasta a los niños y a los pequeños que les están hablando de una manera despectiva de qué es lo que significa la caza, en lugar de darle criterios objetivos y que ellos después puedan desarrollar, si tienen o no, la afición por el ejercicio de la caza. Y eso que las descalificaciones y la criminalización se haga desde determinadas instituciones y desde ciertos púlpitos. Queremos que se reconozca el valor de la caza y su necesidad de contar con ella y con los principales actores, los cazadores, para la conservación de la biodiversidad y que además es necesario para el aporte económico a las zonas rurales en toda Europa, sin excepción en ningún país. Y termino con una expresión que la repito muchas veces. Nadie como la gente que está en el campo, la que vive y convive con la naturaleza y sus animales, como saber, como para saber, cómo lo tienen que gestionar. Ellos, mejor que nadie, lo saben hacer. Nosotros, los cazadores, mejor que nadie, sabemos cómo nos gusta respetar las reglas del juego que las aprendimos desde niños. Muchas gracias y me tenéis a vuestra disposición. Thank you very much, and it was really important to have a political perspective, and uh, Mr. Juan Ignacio Zoido um, has really delivered that, and um, uh, Mr. Zoido is also somebody that understands hunting very well, and you summarized very well the challenges that we face, and these are the challenges that are core to our campaign, and also what we want. We have a huge policy agenda in front of us, dealing with farming, with soil, with forests, with protected areas, with large carnivores, with invasive alien species, with birds, with chemicals, with firearms, with ammunition, with our animals, with regional hunting. And if 
we're seen as partners, we can really help drive the conservation agenda if the policy is correct and if the policy is fair. And that's the main message that has come out of this event. I really want to thank the um, speakers. We had a welcome from our president, Torbjörn Larsson. Um, we had President Willy Schran from the French Federation of Hunters really talk about strengthening rural voices and the importance of this campaign. Uh, president Manuel Gallardo, who is president of the Royal Spanish Hunting Federation, talking about the importance of hunting to the countryside. Um, Linda Dombrovska, vice president for the Baltic region in FACE, um, talked about hunting and society. Uh, Christopher Graffius from the British Association for Shooting and Conservation talked about ensuring the political awareness of our value. And uh, Gianluca Delalio, Vice President for Italy in FACE, talked about the need for an evidence base for <clears throat> sustainable hunting. So really to summarize, we have, as you can see, 150,000 taking into account paper-based signatures, almost 200,000, and we're about halfway through this campaign. It is allowing the European hunting community to really express themselves. We want a strong future for hunting and conservation in Europe, and this campaign will be an important part of that. So again, um, Juan Ignacio Zoido, thank you very much for providing uh, an excellent political perspective also, President of FACE, Torbjörn Larsson, thank you. And thank you to all of the FACE members that are active in communicating uh, the importance of Brussels in terms of the future for hunting and conservation and the importance for a positive and constructive framework going forward so we can deliver the EU's conservation agenda. So with that, I propose we close the event and we move to um our next venture thank you very much also to my staff that organized this event very successfully there will be a recording afterwards which we will share with you thank you very much again and to our next venture <laughs>